Are we live yet? Check us out. All right, good morning. How is everybody doing? Hope everybody is well and having an awesome day. Just checking out, make sure everything's working. You let me know if something's wrong. I am standing here reading your uh, your chats prior to us going live, so uh, appreciate it. I'll get to uh, some of your uh, your questions. Okay, um, Brent, I'll hit you back here. Uh, my, if I'm going to be practicing a lot more uh, than normal next few months around the green, should I use two clubs like 56 and 60? Um, for most shots or 60 and 8 iron, what do pros okay, generally use? Okay, so yeah, you're going to be practicing a lot more. And in each practice session that I go through, we're going to be doing different things. So we're going to use a lot of your highest lofted. I will say usually in the video, use your highest lofted club or your second highest lofted club. And we'll go from there. because. In this setup I have in the bag, currently I, my highest is a 58. And my other setups I have a 60. So I will mix it up. It's winter, or winter's coming, so there's a lot, uh, things are softer. So I use a 58. And uh, the balances on my Mizunos are where I want them to be for winter conditions. So that's why um, I would do that. But what we're gonna do is, in those sessions, we'll mix it up. We'll chip with seven irons, we'll chip with eight irons, we'll chip with nine irons, we'll chip with six irons. We'll do a lot of different short game stuff. So follow that as best as you can and we'll, we'll hit everything. But if you're just out on your own, yeah, I would mix it up. That's always a good idea. Uh, the pros, when they're chipping, they use whatever, um, they use a number of different clubs. So if they don't just stick with one, uh, they'll use a pitching wedge, gap wedge, sand wedge, 60, 64, 62, um, you name it. All the way down, you know, some of them are hitting little five iron chipping runners, you know, just running it up there. So uh, even on TV when you hear him, oh, he's hitting a wedge. Well, maybe, but wh what wedge? We just don't know. So you've got to actually be there and look in the bag and stand there and say, oh, he's got a gap wedge or whatever it is. So we use a bunch of different stuff. Would you rather close down a 56 or 60 for more rollout or an eight iron? Uh, okay, so since you're practicing more, you can experiment with shutting the face and closing down clubs or opening clubs. But generally, what I like to do is just have kind of one standard setup and then move it and change it around a little bit in terms of my clubs, change that. I don't like to shut clubs down too much for more rollout, I'll just grab a different club. But if I'm practicing a lot, then I will experiment and do more of that kind of stuff. And then the lie would dictate a lot of the stuff I'd, I do as well. And Jeff, uh, Jeff has a legal chipper, which he uses with success. And so, uh, you know, what's my opinion on that? Look, I don't generally buy clubs for a single purpose, okay? I used to have a two iron in my bag, but I only hit it, I, I rarely hit it. I wouldn't hit it off the tee very often, and I would use it for like getting out of trouble, like punching it, and so I, it, that's the only reason I used it was punching it low under trees, but so it had one purpose. So I got rid of it and I said, no, I can knock down a four iron just as easily as I can hit that two iron. And off the tee, I hit my hybrid as far as I hit that two iron anyway, so it didn't make any sense to have it. So I would um, not have a club for one purpose, me personally, because I can, the chipper, I can use a seven iron or eight or whatever and have the same result. But that's me, you know, you've got to ask yourself, like, is it worth it in your bag to, um, to have a club that you can only use for one shot? And if it is, then great. If it's not, then I would say, look, it's a waste of a club in your bag. Uh, 
Hey Houston, how's it going? Okay, I scooped up an SM7 M grind 58.8 this weekend. Currently I have a 56 and 60.10 bounce. Right on. Yeah, those, those M's are awesome. I love them. I just got these uh, Mizunos with the cobalt blue finish, the S18s. And I've been uh, checking these out. I'll do a review video on these. I posted a thing on Instagram. Literally, I got my 54 and I was doing a, a chipping video, which I believe comes out tomorrow or Friday, whatever's on deck for our next practice session. I think it's chipping. And I, I literally, I hit five balls. The first one I missed, the next four went in the hole. So, so far I'm loving these Mizunos. Italy, what's happening? Shop credit is good. Uh, okay. How are Tour Bros, Pro's backspin the ball so much, like usually it's 10 to 20 feet? Is it because of extreme hand action? No, it's not. Um, okay, kind of go through this. It's not because of extreme hand action at impact at all. It's actually, uh, what happens, extreme hand action and impact gets the ball really high, okay? that's. You're gonna flip those wrists or you turn it over, you're creating a lot of um, spin, a lot of side spin, and the ball typically will go high. But these pros, they can man, they can flight it really low and get a ton of check. So what they're doing is, as they come down, their hands are just, you know, really far in front of their, their club. So then you have a wedge with pretty new grooves coming down on that ball they're hitting the ball right here and their divots coming way after the ball. So they're really pinching that ball into the turf. And that's something I would think about is don't try to hit the ball up with the wedges. You're trying to shove that ball, pinch it into the ground. Like you literally want to try to squeeze that ball into the ground like that. Pinch it into the earth. Like that should be your mindset as you go. Like how can I shove that ball down? And then it, you'll get a ton of, a ton of spin. And that ball, like that wedge went really low. And that's what you want. The lower it goes with the wedge, the more backspin it will have. Because think about it, if it's spinning a ton, backspin, and it goes really high, it's in the air a long time, so it's wasting its spin in the air. You want it to use the spin on the ground. Boom, and then check back. So the less it's in the air, the sooner you get it out of the air, the more that spin will work for your advantage by us backing up on the green, if that's what you're looking for. And you know, sometimes backing up too much can, can hurt you. So hands just a touch forward, you know, rotate through, and then as you come down, just try to pinch that ball down into the earth. And a shorter, I gotta get some of that ball in my grooves. And a shorter backswing will help you there too. When you start getting way up here, you notice like none of them are really up here with a wedge, right? They're down here and that way they can control it. So less hands, more control, shorter swing. and pinch that ball down in the earth. All right. Getting a different bounce and other wedges. Awesome, Josh. Yeah, you know, when you start messing around with your bounce and your grinds and your lofts and really getting those dialed in, you're gonna see a big difference uh, in your game. And when you're chipping, you, you're gonna be able to feel it. So, and it's different, you know, some people have a more uh, steep angle of attack, so they may need uh, a bigger bounce. Whereas some shallower players might use a lot less bounce uh, because they're already coming in so shallow, they don't want more bounce hitting, hitting the ground too soon. And then the grinds, again, if you're coming in shallow, you might want some of the heel grinded off or for a little steep, you might want that toe grinded off depending on how you like to work the ball or just what you feel through impact. And all that uh, really goes into play 
And it also affects the weight of the club, so it feels different in your hand. You, some might have more toe weight because the heel grind is, bound, uh, is, is uh, a lot less on the heel and vice versa. So it's all in your feel. The more you practice, the better you'll be able to feel the difference in bounces and grinds. And really, you, I would test those out in the sand a lot. Like, take your wedges, let's say you have a 60 or a 58, and it has eight or 10 degrees of bounce, and then take your 54 or your 56 and take it out of the sand and open them up and see which one, if they're different bounces and grinds, see which one works better for you. Just because a 60 has more loft doesn't mean you use it out of the sand. You want to use the one that performs the best for your swing and your tendencies and this type of sand you're playing in. That's why I would have a different uh, grind and bounce on my 60 and my 56. I never have those two clubs exactly the same. Because if I'm playing a course that has real fluffy sand, I'm gonna go with more bounce. And then, so my 60 would have more bounce, my 56 would have a lot less. And then if I'm playing a really hard packed course, even if I have a short bunker shot, I'll just open up that 56, it has a lot less bounce, and then I could hit that shot uh, right out of the sand, that hard packed sand, because you want less bounce in that situation. All right, how do you play lower shot that rolls out versus lower shot that stops quicker? Great question, all right. So, so a lot of times, let's say I have um, 100 yards and I want it to roll out. I might take a, shoot, I might take an eight iron right here because I let pins in the back, we're playing soft greens, right? It's winter's coming, uh, things are wet. I want it to roll. I don't want this to stop and I don't want to fly it all the way back because the pin's in the back and if I go a little long, then I have a tough chip shot come back to the hole. So I want to take something, land it front or middle of the green and let it roll to the hole. So I'll take an eight iron and just do this little, this little like pitch shot with an eight iron, say it's a hundred yards, you know, I'm right here. Those are fantastic, especially this time of year because that ground's getting softer. And that fairway might be a little mushier. Maybe you don't want a big old sharp wedge going in there. So I just take an eight, shallow out that swing. Easy, that thing's gonna hit and just release to the hole. So go longer club. Eight iron, you don't have, just cause you have a hundred yards doesn't mean you have to hit a sand wedge or whatever. I go eight iron all day long. Have fun with it out there, right? The goal is to score, not to hit a sand wedge a hundred yards. It's not your goal. Your goal is to get this thing, make a birdie here. You want this to roll out? I'm telling you, you're gonna start doing this and you're gonna, you're gonna do it a lot, just in general, because it's so much easier than some other shots of taking a longer swing. Take a longer swing, a lot of problems can happen. So just a little eight iron, seven iron, boom. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna wanna play that shot more often because it's more fun. Oh, I watched a video on spin today where he was teaching the opposite. He said, don't deloft, don't pinch the ball. I agree with your approach. Yeah, I mean, there's different philosophies out there for spin, uh, for sure. But typically, I'm not necessarily, I mean, I guess if your hands are going forward, you are delofting it. But how high do you want the ball? That's the key. I believe wedges, my personal opinion is the short clubs go low, the long clubs should go high and you're going to be a great player I and mean, you'll get good spin out of there. How do you make consistent ball contact? Hasty J. All right, Jay. Uh, the key is really controlling your swing. That's really it in a nutshell. I take a nice, nice stance I'm in control of everything right now and I'm gonna take a short backswing if you can't make good ball contact you got to keep shortening that swing until you do because literally you, you can you can make solid ball contact all day right there all day long you make great ball contact right there nobody ever 
struggles with ball contact putting because it's such a short swing. You could pretty much hit your putter in the middle every time. So that's the key. You, that, so let's just simplify it. Short swing. Short swing for starters, shorten the swing. And you rule, you'll start wearing out your club. I mean, my eight iron, people laugh at me all the time. I show up to the, to the course um, with this guy. I mean, you could see, right? There's some wear pattern there. I pull this thing out and trust me, I mean, I'm playing a match. People are like, oh, uh-oh. <laughs> they just notice it right every single time. And it's something that uh, you get by shortening your swing. So uh, that's what I would work on. Shorten it, shorten it first, okay? And then the second thing you have to look at is, are your hands too active? Okay, because you start flipping those, you're gonna flip it a lot and it's just not gonna be a, a good solid ball strike. You, you, when, they, when they talk about good ball strikers on tour, like he makes solid ball, kind of like his ball sounds different than other people. It's because his impact is so solid. His hand, the club isn't moving through impact too much, all right? It's pretty square the whole time. That's why Jack Nichols was so great because from here to here, that club didn't rotate. So the second thing was really keep a, a quiet hands and uh, a short swing. All right, where? All right, how? Hi, right, I'm really struggling reading putting. How do you read the greens more accurate? Okay, so. In our practice sessions, we're gonna do a lot of putting stuff that's gonna just automatically help you with that because you're gonna do a lot of three footers around the hole like you did yesterday. You're gonna do a lot of six footers around the hole like you're doing here next week. You're going to do a lot of different putting drills and it's going to just naturally uh, sink in, right? It's kind of like learning a new language. The first time you go to a foreign country wherever that may be, right? Uh, and you're like, oh, I don't understand a thing. But the longer you're there, the more you start picking up the other language. So same in the green reading. The longer you're on that putting green, the more you start seeing little stuff. So we're gonna get you um, kind of familiar with that new language. We just gotta be on that green a lot more, doing a lot more different putting drills, which nobody ever really takes you through that in terms of a practice session. And I want to be able to do that for you guys so that you can, you'll learn it naturally. And it'll just be, you know, it's a natural thing. Like whatever language you speak, if you're in Italy, if you're Italian, if you're Spanish, English, whatever, like it's hard to remember learning it if it's your first language. It just naturally happened because you were in that culture. Same thing with green reading. We're going to get you naturally feeling breaks and seeing subtleties that you normally wouldn't see because you're going to be in, in that uh, environment a lot more often, doing a lot more things without having to be too technical. You're going to see it and you're like, oh, that broke a lot. And you'll just start aiming different, aiming different, aiming different. Then when you're on the course, it'll feel like a similar thing you did on the practice green and you'll just naturally aim where you're in a better spot and you'll see it better. That's going to, um, that's really going to be the thing. It's time. Time on the green is how you read better. Okay, need a simple drill to help my daughter, 16, been playing almost two years to get forward shaft lean and turn without flipping. I may be over coaching it. Possibly. Um, I, I would say, look, uh, forward shaft lean, it's a hard thing to teach. Look, typically, even me, like when you see most of my videos, I'm right here. I mean, I'm not, Tiger Woods is here, I, like I'm here. I'm like right down the middle, mostly. And I try, like I really try to, uh, it's hard. It takes a lot of strength. So um, I would say in, what's important for somebody that age is is really getting that those hands here 
you know, instead of breaking down here. So even if they're not so forward right here, right, as long as they can kind of come through straight, like that's what I would be focusing on. Uh, a lot of good drills. I do a nice line drill with my kids. This helps, you know, I set up 10 balls. Um, setup's gonna be key, maybe put their hands a touch forward. And then I just have them here and do, you know, do 10 balls like that. And then the last one, they're finishing straight up on their toe. But as they do this, they're here and they're staying down, which forces your arms to kind of extend a little bit more. Then you come back and you're extending. And you're extending, because when you have to bring your hands back, it's hard to break down and then bring your hands back. So you just naturally, you're, you extend and pull back. Extend and pull back. Extend and pull back. And so that's gonna help you have a, a great extension through your, uh, through your release as you, as you hit the ball. That would be the drill I would work on with my kids. Congrats number 25. What does that mean? I don't know. 25 what? Okay. My son, Gavin, who is nine, just got his first eagle. Awesome. 305 yards. Hit driver to 106. He says, remember Mr. Short Game video on hitting low shots? Perfect, dude. Congrats, man. Dude, those eagles with those juniors are so much fun, dude. I remember my kid, uh, when he got his first, and uh, it's a pretty cool time. You know, it's typically that par, that par five or, or a drivable par four. Sometimes, you know, they're young. I think my son was six or something, and it was like a 205-yard par four, and he, you know, drove it. Or it was a 160-yard par four, something like that. You know, they drive the green, they putt it in. It's pretty cool to see. Love it. Love seeing kids... Uh, you know, get in the game. Yep. Dude, you got it, man. Happy to help. How do you stop your head moving down on the backswing? All right, well, let's get into this. Okay, so your head, as you're on the backswing or on the forward swing, what'd you say? During the backswing, okay. So your head moving down, so you kind of, you're doing this. If your head's going down, you're dipping your shoulders down like this, right? So what I like to feel is my shoulder hitting my chin. Like if I dip down, that's never gonna happen, right? I want this shoulder, I'm trying to keep my shoulders high. So I want this shoulder to come around under my chin. Here, like you're going down, most likely, I want you to go more around. So just practice that right here. That shoulder comes around under your chin. Okay? Here. Instead of here. Right? Big difference? So I'm just turning. Like if you stood straight up, if you, touched, if you were standing straight up and you just turned, right? You would never turn like that, right? So this is, this is the move. Just turn. Right here. Okay? And then you're just bent over just a touch. So. So that's all you're working on, is that turn. You don't want to get down like this. Okay, so just right up here. Boop. You're good. And I like to keep my chin up. That'll help you. Chin up. And you're good. That's kind of the, the simple fix for that. Chin up. Oh, number 25 live show. Thanks. You're welcome. Ah. <laughs> All right. Will you make a half speed swing without a club so I can see your hand pass? Sure. Half swing without a club. I'll try. Usually when I do this, like what happens currently, but I'll try to make it so it's what would happen in a real stick, but who knows? Does that help? I'll do it again. This is a good drill, by the way. So my hand path is. I'm 
right there. Does that match my real swing? You tell me. I mean, I'm here. All right. I don't know. You know. Hope that helps. Hope that helps. Let's look at um something that um. So you guys have seen uh, Cameron Champ, new kid on tour, winner, huge, huge hitter. Doesn't even look like he's barely swinging, and it goes 340 yards. I mean, he hit driver wedge to par fives this weekend, last weekend, and uh, he's gonna just destroy golf courses. So kind of for a long time, the modern swing has been don't turn the hips, just turn your shoulders, and create this resistance between your shoulders and your hip and then unleash it and smash the ball. Okay, that's great, but now there's a lot of back issues on tour these days, primarily because of that, because you're twisting one thing, restricting the other, you feel all this torque in your lower back and then you have this you know, moment where you just unleash it and again, put more torque and tweak on your, on your lower back. So it's gonna really mess you up. Whereas guys like uh, Phil Mickelson, he, he didn't really have back issues. Uh, a lot of guys uh, that swing uh, a little bit differently don't have it. So, and Cameron Champ does the same thing. What he's doing is he's, he's really turning his hips, which I, I love. I love that. Okay, I, I want the hips to turn. So let's turn the hips, but let's turn it without moving our weight to the right side too much. Let's just get this right hip and get it going back here. This leg could be straight, but all my power's down, down low now. And then here, I'm actually trying to keep my head back and maybe move forward here and back here a little bit and stay back here. And then open my shoulders and rotate through. So it's a tricky move, but for starters, just think about pushing this hip back. Let's let that hip turn. You're gonna get more distance that way. But don't come out here. You do this, you just lost 20 yards. This move, getting that hip out here, you lose 20 yards right out of the gate. Okay, so just know when you sh shift that weight over here, you're losing 20 yards. That's it. It's amazing. That little bit of at least 20 yards right there. So if you could just turn that back, you, you, that's 20 yards of distance right there you're picking up. Pick here and then just whoosh, and you're gonna make much more solid ball contact as well. Now my club head speed, I just picked up a few miles an hour. My club head speed just by doing that. So you hear, that's the first move. Just work on that for a while. And the, you know, the second piece would be, as you come down, I wanna feel my head kinda of going backwards. And, and opening my, my shoulders up at the same time. It's tricky, but let's just get this first. Hip here. So if there's a club here and I take it back, I'm creating space right here. Right, that club stayed here. Here's my setup and my swing. I created space and then I come down and I'm right there. And you get a better better ball strike. Do you wear a glove? I, you know, I always wear a glove, except when I'm doing these shows for some strange reason. I don't know why. Uh, when I practice, I always wear a glove. When I play, I always wear a glove. For here, I, I don't know, I'm not wearing a glove. I don't know why, but I usually do. And the only time I don't wear a glove is when I'm chipping or I'm in the sand. And I just always take it off, I don't know why. Uh, I like to feel it in my hands, so I like to chip without a glove. And my sand shots, no glove. Thanks for asking. Okay, John Seal, I have a pitching wedge, sand wedge, lob wedge. Do I need like a gap wedge to fill in between pitching and sand? Typically, I would say yes. Uh, the pitching wedge is usually a 46 degree, and then your sand wedge is probably a 56. So you have 10, 10 you know, loft angles of, 
of area there to cover. So if your pitching wedge is 46, your nine iron is like, uh, I forget, 40 or so, I don't remember, but uh, you, you know, if you have a sand is 56 and then you go to 60, that's four degrees of loft, which is about 10, 15 yards, depending on how far you hit the ball. So if that's the case, your pitching wedge, let's say it goes 125. And then your sand wedge, 10 more degrees, that's, that could be 30 yards. So that's 95. So you got a 95 club and a 125 yard club, but you don't have a 115 yard club. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna back off your pitching wedge 10 yards? That's a lot. Or you're gonna step on your sand wedge 10 yards? That's asking a lot. So you gotta, yeah, I would say you definitely want something right there that's going to make up that gap difference. Or, or you can always do 46, 51 or two, at six, 52, 58, right? And go six, go six uh, degrees of loft in between and stretch it out. That's if you need something uh, for, you know, else in your bag, like an extra hybrid or another iron that's more beneficial to you than that wedge, right? So I would go like 58, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, go 52, 51, 50, 49, 48, 47, 46. You go 46, 52, 58, and you're kind of covered in three wedges. Not ideal, but if you need that extra hybrid because you're not a long hitter or something, then I would do that. However, your scoring clubs are your like eight iron down. So from eight iron down, I would want my distances just rock solid. I, want, I don't want any holes in there at all because that's where I'm gonna make birdies in your scoring club. So that's where I would fill it in. Whereas I would have a gap, I'd rather have a gap between my hybrid and my four or five iron because I made it up in my wedges where the ball is going to be closer to the hole anyways. Hope that helps. Because, right, you don't want, you don't want a hole there. So I would lose one of my long irons, which I did. I took my two and three iron out of the bag. I start with a four, I have a four, five, and six. And then I go, uh, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, whatever. And then, but after the four is my, my hybrid. So my four goes about 200, my, this hybrid goes about um, 225. So there's 25 yards there. But for me, you know, that's, that's totally fine. Because I don't, I don't need something that goes 210. I'd rather, if I need a 210, I'll take this and play a cut shot and smooth this and, and say, okay, I'd rather have this 210. Because if I don't hit it or it goes too far, then I have the wedges to get it close. And typically if I'm, it's either a really long par four that I'm going at in two for my second shot, or it's a shorter par five and I'm going after it with this. So in either case, I'm gonna get up and down for birdie or, or par. What else you guys got here for you? Uh, let me know how those practice sessions are working out. I've been getting a lot of comments. We just had one day. Don't quit on me if you're in. Now, look, what do you do if you're in colder climates? All right, look, there's a, um, I have a link in the description below for the Gen I 2 Golf Ball. I believe they're out now. So look into that, that's an option because it's a ball with a smart chip in it and you can be indoors and you can hit your shots and it will, it will give you feedback of what, what you did on the application, on the app. And you can even chip. So let's say we're doing a little chip and runs, you can still do those. And you can still do your chip shots indoors. And here's how I would do, it, do that. Let's say we're doing short chip shots or something. 
Uh, let me get a club here. Okay, you're doing short chip shots. Now I, I would be doing chip and runs, right? So I, look, I would just put a basket there and then th that's my target. So if I say one bag shake full to that target, look, just practice going into the basket, right? Do your bag that, and so this is your, this would be your practice, trying to get it in that, in that bag. And if you have a mat like this, you can go out of the rough too. Come here, there you go, and mix it up. This is the Motivo golf mat. And then I would continue to work just indoors, you know, if you can. Putting is gonna be more difficult indoors, but you can always putt to a cup, to a, get, get a little hole, get a short uh, putting, putting setup, because we wanna keep those short putts tight, even during the winter. We don't wanna let those get away from us. The lag putting, yeah, that's gonna be a little more challenging indoors, right? So don't worry about that so much. Add, add in another uh, short, short putting uh, drill. So redo one of the, short, the three footers or the six footers or something like that so that you can uh, continue that because you want to be rock solid. If you're always making three, four, five, six footers, then you're not going to have to worry about your lag putting so much. Okay, video suggestion. More videos working with your wife, like pitching over the pool. Great for us. Not so perfect players to see. Okay, you got it. I gotta talk her into it. Um, but we'll, we'll get her. She's, she's certainly not a golfer, but I'll, uh, I'll try to talk her into doing more stuff. She's always game. She's awesome. What I'm Lampkin, I have a Lampkin grips on everything, but I just got these wedges and they came with golf rides. So I just, they're on there. They're on there, so I hate peeling off brand new golf fry grips, but I do have the lambkins right here. There's definitely a big difference. Uh, I do like the lambkin. Okay. All right, Jeff, you like the pool, pool shot too. Awesome. Am I a pro? Uh, well, yes and no. Uh, am I a member of the PGA America? No, I am not. Am I considered a professional? Yes, I am. So, but you don't have to be a member of the, the PGA of America to be a professional. That is just, uh, those are just people who went to school at their academy and got their certification. There's no difference between them and, um, and anybody else who's a professional. It's just, uh, they, they've got their, uh, their mark in the industry as kind of the standard, but uh, uh, yeah, that's all I can really say about that at the moment. Are there any inherent issues with using the claw putting grip? Uh, you know what? Um, that's up to you. I've tried a million grips. I've tried cross-handed. That doesn't really do it for me. The claw, I, it's just not my thing. My philosophy with putting has always been um, like never change your grip. That's just my theory. I, I'm not going to say it's right or wrong. That's just my, that's how I look at it. Because for me, putting is so mental that if I start doubting myself, then I'm going to miss. So what I've told myself is you will never, ever change your putting grip your entire life. <laughs> right? And so my brain uh, believes this to be true because I've never changed it. 
And so that's never an option for me. So mentally, I'm like, I'm never changing that. All I'm going to do is practice more. So I don't know. But some guys don't, you know, don't do that. So because if I start changing everything, and then all of a sudden I go through a slump, then I'm going to keep changing. It's, oh, I better change. I better change. I better change. Something's wrong. I got to change something. And I, I just don't believe that always changing your grip is the right move for me. Because you would never, like, just because you're chipping poorly, you, you're not going to go changing your grip. If you're swinging bad, are you always changing your golf grip? No, you never change. You kind of like, okay, this is, good, I have a great grip, I'm never changing it. And that's your swing. You might tweak your swing a little bit, but. Just because you have a bad round or a bad month, you're not going to go. The tour guys, are, you know, they're kind of getting their swing back to where it wants to be, but they're not dramatically, drastically changing it. That's kind of disastrous. So I don't do that in putting. I think if you're putting, I use this. I use this grip. Just that reverse overlap, finger down, and boom. I might change my putter occasionally. That's about it. Yeah, 25 live episodes. I can't believe it. That's a lot. All right, so again, we're working on that hip. Hip around. Here. You can straighten that. Like, don't get it too straight. Keep a little knee bend in there. But just here. Boom. And then come forward with the lower body. Back with the upper body. You're gonna pick up distance just doing that. Just here, and then forward with the lower body, back with the upper body, and rotate through. Because you get it here, and then you really could drive off that back foot. So you get a lot more power and oomph through the ball. That should be, that's 20 yards extra right there. No charge. Come. Give it a go. Feels good. Yeah, I mean, if the claw, so Jeff, if the claw helps you, then great. If you're yipping, yeah, I think, okay, there's a caveat. That if you're yipping, you're going to have to figure something out. Look at Bernard Longer. He had the yips. And he's one of the greatest putters on the Champions Tour, if not the best. So uh, I think if you're yipping, you got to try to work on things that, that do help you avoid that. So I would say, look, if, that would be the one kind of caveat. If you're yipping, then I would look at other options because that's something you got to get rid of. Hmm. Because your right wrist is at the right angle to the grip. Yeah. So yeah, if your wrist is here, it could, so here, I get it. I've never done it, so maybe I'll try it. But again, like once I start trying stuff, then, <laughs> then I think that's an option to change. But I usually don't yip. That's not my thing. Um, so everybody's got their, their things that they do. I do other stuff. Like, just hit bad putts. That's what I do. What are good points to focus on the course if I'm pulling drives? So, on course, yeah, it's tough. It's tough when you're on course, you start pulling a bunch of stuff. Uh, so, I like to focus on this. Let's say I got my driver here. Okay. So, you know, why are you pulling drives? Are you, com are you coming over the top a little bit, uh, doing stuff like that? What's the culprit? I would always check my aim. It's easy to aim left. It's easy to aim right. Everybody's got aiming issues, always. So you really got to focus on just being, being square. So one thing is, if I face the target, right, Right here, I'm facing where I'm gonna aim, exactly. So 
if I'm aiming a little to the right, I'm just right there. I'm just going a little right, I'm going a little left, I'm going right here, facing it, right? Once I face it straight away, it's easy for me to turn 90 degrees from this point. Does that make sense? Like if I'm just here kind of sideways and I'm looking sideways, it's how do I, how do I aim? Because I know I got to be parallel to the, to the target, right? But if I started here, it's, it's harder to get. Now I'm, now I'm off. So I want to stand here facing the target off to the side of the ball. Does that make sense? So here I'm parallel with the ball. The ball's about as far away as, as my, as it would be in setup. And I'm facing the target, I'm 90 degrees to the target, right? Because aim is going to be key here. Now I can, it's easy to turn 90 degrees. That's easy. Boom. Now I just set up. Now, now from here, I'm not going to move my body. I'm just going to turn my head really carefully. I don't want to turn like this because that's going to be disastrous because your shoulders are now open and you look back and your shoulders are wide open. All right? So I set up here. Really be careful as I turn my head not to move anything else. Okay, now I know I'm good. So that may take a minute to figure out, but it's something you can work on on the range. Just right here, 90 degrees, 90 degrees, set up, turn your head, not anything else, and you're good. That's what I do when I start pulling drives, is really focus on my aim. And then look, if. If things are off that day, they're just gonna be off. And, th and that could happen too. And you'll have to go figure something out on the range and, and groove it out. Maybe it's, your swing is just off, your timing's off, but typically it's aim. Typically, if you can fix your aim on course. And it's hard, like for me, I'll look at, um, like you see some of the videos I've done on course and I've, I'm driving all over the place and I go back and I'm editing that video and I'm aimed, my feet are just a little to the right. Happens a lot. I'm like, man, really? How is that? So that's just, for me that happens, even putting my, my right foot just drops back a little bit too much. And it, it, like that feels perfectly normal to me. But I look and look at, look at my feet, you know? Like I'm, that's aiming right. And I want it to aim straight, so I'm like, all right, I gotta get there. So I'll, I'll start off the day really making sure I aim left. So I wanna aim left, okay, there we go. And so that's how I'm gonna start the day, aiming left. Uh, for me. But we all got our things, right? It's usually alignment and setup that's going to, uh, that's gonna be a, uh, our, our thing that's gonna help us out. Yeah, I can hit so many great shots in a row on the range and then suddenly shank. That happens. I hear you. I've done it. You know, there's not much difference between a great shot and a shank. I mean, it's we're talking an inch, an inch. Uh, but again, it's going to be a couple things. One, if you're on the range, you want to mix up your target all the time. Aim over here, aim over here. Don't hit to the same shot, the same spot more than twice in a row. Keep moving it around. And because what happens, you get in this groove, you're right here, you're right here, you're right here, everything's good. And then all of a sudden you get on the course. This is why people can't take their range game to the course. Cause they're here, they're hitting the same exact shot from the same exact spot all the time. Boom, boom, boom. And then they get on the course and it's shaped differently all of a sudden. It's like, oh, I gotta aim left now. Oh, that's weird. And you don't, you just kind of aim. There you go, that feels good. But the fairways over here, like you're like, okay. Okay, that feels good. That feels like I, that was, that now I feel like I was at the range. And you're like, where am I? You know, and people are like, dude, where are you aiming? You're aiming way over here, but the, the hole's way over here. So that's what happens. So when you're on the range, mix it up. I mean, left to right. Do not 
get in a little mundane, you know, shallow, singular focus mode where you're just, because I've been there. I'm like, dude, I hit that so pure. And I'm just smoking three woods. Like, I'm hitting a pole at the back of the range. And I'm like, dude, I'm hitting that pole. I hit it like every shot, like almost hits the pole. And it's just perfect three woods. And then I go out on the course and I'm like, Shh, duck hooking every three wood. I'm like, what's wrong? I was just peering the thing. What happened? Because you just got stuck in one mode, in one location, facing one direction, doing the same exact thing. And of course, you never have the same exact shot twice. So why would you do it on the range? Okay, hi man, I always told to pick up an intermediate point just in front of the ball and meet the target. Yeah, so you could do that too. So let's say, um, put that ball out there. A lot of people, Jack Nicholas talk a lot about this. A lot of people do. I do it. Like I pick out a divot or something like, okay, I'm going right over that ball and draw a line and then I aim at that ball. Yeah, that's great. So now I'm just lining up at that ball. That's what a lot of people do. I'm like, you could really, per perfectly, great. And then you set up and then I look at that. I just take one look at my target back to that ball and I'm going. So that's a great way to do it. You could do that putting as well. I would always pick like a little speck of grass. I'm like, dude, I can roll it over this thing all day long. I got that. And then that, that's my, and then I just put it right over that. And if I hit that, it rolls in all. So that's great. That's a great way to go. I love that. But you have to practice that at the range too. So don't just think about that like, oh, I'm going to pick a divot or an intermediate target or something just up here or right out there. Like you have to practice that at the range so you're comfortable with it. So it looks right. So you're used to aiming at different areas. Otherwise, again, you're going to be in that same boat. How about a drill to reduce early hip turn or sway? Okay. Yeah. Uh, I don't see too many people have an early hip turn. I mean, I see people lose their spine angle because their hips go forward instead of around. Um, I do see the sway a lot. This is something that, this is a yardage killer. This is a swing killer, right? Any of this. So you want to get, that's why I do this. I do this forward, forward drill where I'm going forward. I'm actually turning here, weight more on my front foot. You know, it's not, it's a drill. Just remember, it's a drill to avoid this, but you're turning and you feel like your weight's coming forward. And you can even go forward, backwards would work too, where you kind of come in forward. And then as you swing, I'm going back. And then, so, so it's a forward, back, forward. Make sense? So I'm kind of going forward, back, forward. Now, it's tricky. And you're barely going to do it. You're barely going to go back. But the key is we've got to avoid, put that club here, we've got to, we got to avoid this, that, okay? We want, to, we want to work around here. So just put maybe the club right on your belt. Now if you sway back, if you sway and turn, that's what it's going to look like. I just want to turn right to there. Turn right to there. And then the, uh, the last piece of that would be just get your club, throw it down, face in behind you, stand on your grip with just the, the outside half of your foot. Right there. So now I can really turn. If I sway, I'm gonna be stepping on my club too much. You can feel that. And that's just, the more you stay on that inside of that back foot, the better it's gonna be for you. All right, just stand here. And that's, this is one I love the, the most. 
because it really forces you to stay inside. And then when you, when you lose the club, all should be good. And that's what you want. Hopefully, I should work out. Because anytime, anytime you sway, just know you your yard. So we really got to keep that. You can also look at your shadow here. If the sun's behind you, see your shadow right behind you. And just focus, put a ball. I don't know if you can see this, but I put a ball on my shadow on my right hip. And as I take it back, I don't want to see, I want to see the, the sunlight in between me and that ball. So I'm just boop. And I just want to stay back like that. Because if I take it back here and I cover the ball with my shadow, I've swayed. So just put that ball on your right hip, right there. Move into it. Boom. Create a little space. And you're good to go. Practice that 500 times. And then do it while you hit your shots. Solid. You're good. Hey, Matt. All right, Frank. Uh, I take too much sand in the bunker. Yeah, okay. Here's what you're going to practice. Take your whatever club you use out of sand. So there's a couple reasons you do this. I, I've done it a lot too. It's kind of a tendency of mine. You could be coming too steep on the ball, for sure. We'll do it. Or I come too shallow and I shallow out and I start digging the sand way behind the ball and I start taking a lot of sand. So I'm going to open up the club a little bit. I'm going to aim just a touch left, not too much. Now, I want to bring, I don't, I'm not bringing the club up, okay? It's going it's to come up, but I'm going to bring the club just out here and I'm not really hinging my wrists, okay? I'm just going to come out here. And then what I'm thinking about from this point forward is pulling the handle around to my left pocket. So I'm really kind of going through here with the open club face, slightly open club face. So I'm going outside like that. Now, I'm not in the sand, obviously, but this gets you, I don't want to come up. Okay, I just want to go out. So straight arms here, and then just rotate that around to your left. Try that and see if, you know, it's kind of like, like that move. And you can practice it off the mat as well because you want to just do those shots and then you, you want to get more more speed when you're in the bunker uh, but I found when I kick it inside I start shallowing out a little too early and digging too deep in the sand or if I hinge my wrist and pick it up I'm digging straight down in the sand as well so I just throw everything outside a little bit and really accelerate through that ball just uh, as fast as you can. Just here, right there, okay? So you're here, and you're here, and you're holding that face open out here. You're not letting that toe rotate closed. Try that, let me know how that works. It's something that I've had to work a lot on because I do take a lot of sand, and I don't like doing that. I like to take a little bit of sand. And, um, but that's what I do, all right. Mogi, 2266. Hey, I don't want to interrupt you. Hey, that's why we're here, man. That's why you're not interrupting. You're part of the chat. Thanks for joining in. Uh, all right, two, th these last two. Uh, I don't want to interrupt you. My problem is my chipping is not very good. All right. So do, do the practice sessions the best you can, chipping. And just, man, you got to spend a lot more time chipping. I want, just this, this is your focus right now. Feet closer together. Hands in the middle, and I, I really want you to hit with your belly button, okay? Like just, boom. Like I want you to think there's a tiny little club hanging off your belly button, all right? I know it's weird, right? 
and I want you to think of like, boom. Like that's what you're trying to hit the ball with, your belly button. So just think about the club come and just, and just do it, visualize this, right? I got a belly button cl club. Belly button ring, get a belly button club. And you're just, mm, right? Just, mm. What's it gonna take to hit that ball, right? Mm. Right there. <laughs> I know, it's weird. Okay, now I want you to put everything here and it's still belly button club, chipping. Okay, you're not swinging your arms. I'm swinging my, my, my belly button. This is gonna be like phase one. But I'm telling you, you start doing this, just whatever club you're chipping with. I'm just like, I'm, I'm not swinging my arms. I'm, my arms are kind of connected in here with my armpits and it's just following my belly button. Same move. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not even trying to swing my arms. Belly button. That's like the secret to chipping. Okay, so I want you to start there. As we get there, you're gonna start feeling other things as well as you go. And it's gonna be pretty, pretty amazing. Like some, you'll graduate to more stuff, more feelings. So, but start there, belly button. Just think, man, I'm hitting this with my belly button club. There you go. Good luck. It's gonna work. I know it's gonna work. Okay, last one. Uh, what are my thoughts on stack and tilt? Okay, I know people ask because they do this weird stuff. Um, I'm not a stack and tilt guy, okay? Uh, although there are some pieces of it that, that work, this is not stack and tilt. Like, you know, Johnny Miller was not a stack and tilt guy. They just, they turned their hips back. That's what I like. So, if look, if a stack and tilt works for you, then great. Well, you gotta go with what works. It's not something I, that I necessarily believe in or that's something I, do but i i do believe in getting a little more hip turn and kind of staying behind the ball and driving forward that's kind of my stack until is more up and around i don't even know too much about it uh i used to play with a guy who really believed in it and he was a great player man he bombed it so can't you know i couldn't knock it too much I, but i like a a nice hip turn and crank through that. All right, dude, you guys are awesome. Practice hard, all right? We got another practice day coming tomorrow. Do your best to stick with it, all right? We're gonna drop five strokes by the end of the year. Well, everybody else is getting worse, we're going lower, all right? Uh, that's it, man, love you guys. Thanks for watching, have an awesome day. Crush it, man. I'm out, peace out.